You're listening to The Taylor Marshall Show, episode 109, and we Catholics often deal with this question, and that is, is our faith a religion, or is it a relationship with Christ? Howdy, and thank you for tuning back into The Taylor Marshall Show. This is the podcast for everyone who wants to create daily habits and learn enough theology to take their faith to the next level. And my goal this week is to talk to you about whether our faith, Catholicism, is best understood as a religion or as a relationship. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening wherever you are in the world, and welcome back to the Taylor Marshall Show. I think today's topic is one that will interest all of us because we've all been challenged by evangelicals or Protestants or you know maybe even non-Christians about what is the essence of our theological commitment. What is the bedrock of our faith? Is it primarily being religious or adhering to a world religion, which we call Catholicism, or is it something that's intimate, a relationship? Often, you know, evangelicals will say that I follow a relationship with Christ and not a religion, and that Christ came to do away with religion. And yet we Catholics have a little bit of difficulty with that. So we're going to talk about that today. I wanted to open with something that I don't usually do, and that is a thought or a recollection about a saint. I was in Mass this morning, and I had my little Magnificat daily missile with me, and today it featured St. Wolfstan, which is a saint that I was not familiar with before, and Wolfstan was a bishop in England, and one of the things that this little bio shared about St. Wolfstan is it said that he would go down to Bristol, and at the time, this port city was where poor families, and I'm reading here from the Magnificat, where poor families would come to earn some money by selling their children as slaves to the Vikings. Determined to end this practice, Wolston preached tirelessly to the traders themselves, urging conversion. He was heeded, and in his time, the trade in slaves ceased, end quote. Now, I was reading this morning, I was just reminded, because this was taking place in the 10 hundreds, so the 11th century. You know, sometimes, you know, we of European descent think of ourselves as, you know, we come from Christendom, you know, the old, old lines of Christians. But it's a good reminder that our ancestors, at least my ancestors, were selling their children as slaves to the Vikings. I can't imagine taking my beautiful little children down to the dock and in order to get money, selling them as slaves to the vicious Vikings. It's just unthinkable. And yet it was a common practice. And this is a reminder to us of how much Christianity has changed the way we think about culture, society, and morality. Even atheists and agnostics in our midst have been formed by the morality of Christianity. Christianity brought about the dignity of every single human person. That's something that atheists, most atheists, probably not all, um, would admit to. And yet it was Christianity that brought this turn of events through great saints like St. Wolfston. So St. Wolfston, pray for us, especially pray for us in this time um, in which we sacrifice our own children through the evil of abortion. We'll we'll start off as we usually do with our proverb of the day, and I chose Proverb chapter 14, verse 1, and it goes like this. Wisdom builds her house, but folly with her own hands tears it down. So wisdom, obviously this is personified wisdom, and personified wisdom is not um, a goddess Um St. Paul talks about how Christ is wisdom incarnate. He is the divine plan of God. Um, He is the Son of God. He is the Word of God. He's consubstantial with the Father. Um, But we also gain wisdom, which is a virtue. It's understanding our place in the world and making prudential decisions. 
And so when we gain wisdom, and wisdom, of course, is gained initially through fear of the Lord, we're able to build a house. We're able to construct something. And then the second half of the verse says that folly with her own hands tears it down. So we're talking about building something up and ripping something down. And we probably all know people, maybe it's even ourselves, we've seen folly rip down people's lives through drugs, through addictions, through um, sexual sins, through violence. Um, we've seen foolish decisions tear down the house of people's lives. And so it's important as believers that we gain a heart of wisdom and that we learn to be constructive. Notice here, wisdom builds a house. She constructs something. We need to be constructive in our own lives, but in the lives of others um, through our patience and through our grace and through our prudence. So there it is, Proverbs 14.1. Now our featured segment today is a discussion on whether Catholicism is a religion or a relationship. And I can remember um, when I was younger talking, even when I was in, a, in the Protestant world, um, being somewhat resistant to the evangelical phrase that Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. And I'd always say, of course it's a religion. You know, uh, the Latin word uh, for religion means to bind. You can see in there, uh, religio, right? Ligio is like a ligament, like you have ligaments around your ankles and your knees, and ligaments keep everything straight, keep everything together so that you can run and play and do all kinds of things. The ligaments are important. So a, a religion is what binds things together, and of course Christianity is a religion. Um, we're reminded of James, the epistle of St. James, chapter 1, verse 27, where we read, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And here, St. James specifically calls what we are doing as Christians, he says it's a religion. The Greek word is thresakeia, thresakeia, and it means religion, and it has a very kind of cultic um, ritualistic understanding of religion. That's what that Greek word means. And so St. James is identifying our activity and our belief as Christians as religious. And it's notable how he defines it. He says that our religion before God the Father is to, and he lists three things, visit orphans, visit widows, in their affliction, so we're talking here about the helpless, and thirdly, to keep oneself unstained from the world. So there's a purity here, uh, a moral obligation on us. Now, we Catholics are aware of this. We often think of ourselves as religious, or we say, oh, he is a religious person, she is a religious person, and we often mean, oh, that person goes to Mass every day, that person... Um, praise the rosary every day, or we think of it in a capital R religious, like he or she's a religious, he's a monk, he's a friar, she's a, a nun, and that means they've dedicated their life to this outward um, sign of contradiction against the culture. They wear unusual clothes, robes, they wear a giant rosary on their hip, and they commit to things like the Liturgy of the Hours, where they pray every few hours, and they're involved in apostolates, like, for example, in James there, caring for orphans, caring for widows, caring for the poor, and preaching and helping people to be unstained from the world and following Jesus Christ. And so we Catholics often use the word religion and religious, but I think there's maybe an imbalance there. And I'm not saying, of course, that Catholicism is not a religion. It's not religious, of course not. But maybe we need to focus also on the relationship with Christ. And, you know, I've been Catholic now 10 years, and I reflect on this often, especially as I meet evangelicals. I live in Texas. There's a lot of 
you know, mega church, Bible church, Baptist in the region that I live. And I go to a coffee shop often to prepare these podcasts, to write books, uh, to work on projects. And I often overhear them in their conversations. And I'm surprised, pleasantly surprised in many ways, to hear them um, talk with their pastors or talk with each other. Sometimes there's small groups there in the coffee shop. Um, and they're talking about prayer and they're talking about Bible study and they're talking about leading people to Christ and they're talking about what's going on in their church. And it's evident that although they do have mistakes, and I sometimes hear them say things that um, as Catholics we would know to be incorrect or heretical or theologically incorrect, uh, I do hear a fervency, I do hear a love, and I do hear a relationship that's tangible and real there. And I wish that, you know, we could bring together our religiosity as Catholics, but also this fervor that some um, non-Catholics um, do experience, and they do have a zeal for saving souls, even if it's misled sometimes. And I don't want you to take what I'm saying, you know, too far or too seriously. I'm just just sharing a sentiment and sharing an observation that I've experienced in the last year or so. And I came up with a couple of analogies that I think could be helpful for us as we figure out how we can bring together our religion with our relationship with Jesus Christ, with our Savior, with our Lord. And I've been teaching one of my son's guitar lately, and I've played guitar for about 20 years now. When you begin playing guitar, you know, you have to learn things like how you place your fingers behind the fret to get the right tone so the string doesn't buzz. You have to learn how to tune the guitar. You begin to learn the different scales. You have to memorize the scales. There's a lot of memorization at the beginning. Um, you have to learn the different chord shapes. And not, that's with the left hand, if you're right-handed. With the right hand, you start to learn rhythms. And you have to work hard at getting the left hand doing what it needs to do and the right hand doing the rhythms. And, you know, you also learn about different kinds of guitars and strings and the equipment and amps or pickups or acoustic guitars and different shapes of the guitars, the different tones of it. Um, the rules and how to bend strings and different lengths and, you know, all of these things. And that's kind of, in a way, I think, learning the religion. You're learning the outlines, the contours. You're memorizing the lists. But that itself is not playing guitar with the heart or playing guitar with the soul or being into it. It's kind of like dancing. You know, when you learn to dance, you learn to identify rhythm. So when you hear a song, you can think to yourself, okay, this is a waltz. Uh, this is a, you know, maybe down here in Texas, it's a country western song. So it's a two step or it's a foxtrot or it's a box. You got to be able to identify the music. And then you have to, you know, I'm a man. So when I was a younger man, I had to learn how to hold the woman, how to lead the woman while dancing. And at first you watch your feet, you maybe look down because you're not confident. And you could imagine if you're at a place where there's dancing, you know, you could look at a guy and say, wow, he's really trying hard. He's looking at his feet. He's trying to learn the dances. That's great. But ultimately the purpose of learning the music, learning the dance steps, learning how to lead a woman, or if you're a woman, learning how to follow in the dance is so that you can experience another person. Like when I dance with my wife, we were at a, a party um, a month or two ago and there was country music, we were country western dancing. The point of it is not to look at my feet and make sure that my feet are perfect. Fortunately, Joy and I have learned that. The point of it is so that I can pull her close and look her in the eyes and smile and she smiles back to me and we move around the dance floor. And our children look and they see it and it makes an impression on them. It makes all kinds of impressions about, you know, the synergy of their parents, the love of the parents, the leadership of the father and the, his embrace with their mother. 
and all those things, when people on the side of the dance floor look and see the couple dancing, and they've already done all the quote-unquote religiosity of memorization and practice and all that, then they can enter into the gaze, the real personal and loving element of the dance. And that's what I think we're called to do as disciples of Jesus Christ, followers of Jesus Christ. Yes, we have to memorize the list, you know, the Ten Commandments, the seven virtues, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, all these things, the act of contrition. But that's not, I mean, it is Catholicism, but it's, it's a means. It's not the end. And I think so often Catholics, Catholics in general, especially cultural Catholics, think that memorizing the list or getting your first communion, going through confirmation, or maybe checking off the boxes and moving through RCIA, or learning how to be an altar boy, that that is being Catholic. That's being pious. And in reality, that's just kind of like learning chords to play guitar or learning scales or learning about amplifiers. You know, it's it's the stuff that you have to do, that you have to get caught up on. But ultimately, the reason you learn scales and chords and learn about amps and all that is so that you can make beautiful music. And the purpose of making beautiful music is art. And it's relational. No one makes music and just keeps it to themselves. You make music and you perform it for other people and you talk about it and you share it. When I find a great song that I really love, I want to share it with my kids or with Joy. Hey, listen to this song. It's awesome. You know, people go to concerts. Why? They, they can hear the same song on their iPhone or on the computer. They want to go to the concert because there's an interaction there's something personal about being there with the performer or with the band and experiencing the music live. And, you know, as Catholics, we can memorize the list. We can go through the rites. Baptism, which is a sacrament. Working ex opere operato. If you listen, you know how much I love the sacraments. So... Don't take this the wrong way. But the sacraments are there to introduce us and to take us deeper with the person, Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, divinity. It's not just to check the box off. We don't go to, you don't go to Mass every Sunday just to fulfill your obligation. That's like memorizing the guitar scales just so you can say, I did the guitar scales, I've got them. No, you memorize the guitar scales so that you can play a beautiful guitar solo. You go to the Holy Day of Obligation so you can play a beautiful song in your heart, an interaction with Jesus Christ. It's like reading. You know, you first, as a child, you memorize the alphabet. You sing the song, A, B, C, D. And then you learn the phonics, how the letters work with one another and make sounds. And then if you're an English speaker like me, you learn all the exceptions. And if, you're, if English is a second language to you, you know how many different exceptions we have. Like O-U-G-H is one of those. And then you learn basic reading, like reading Dick and Jane. And then you learn chapter books. And then you learn how to go to the library and find books, and you learn about different kinds of genres and different authors. And hopefully as you get into middle school and high school, you start reading great books, you know, like Homer and Virgil or Shakespeare, Plato, Dante, Beowulf, Dostoevsky, um, you know, great literary works. But even that doesn't make you a voracious reader. It doesn't make you a bookworm. It doesn't make you love books. All of those things set you up to discover great literature, great books. And then it's the rest of your life that you spend in that personal enjoyment of the books in your hands. And so for Catholics, we need to rediscover the sacraments not just as religious rites, which they are, but we need to rediscover them 
as gifts and invitations to have a personal interaction with Jesus Christ. I look back at becoming a parent when we had our first child, and Joy and I read all these parenting books. You know, different there's different schools. And we read about all the things that go into the development of a child in their first year. And we studied things like car seats and play pens and the different kind of diapers and baby food and breastfeeding and all of these things. That, again, was just, those were important things. But that wasn't the same thing as we learned as the years have gone by as being a parent, which is staying up till 3 o'clock talking to your teenage daughter or going on a walk with one of your kids and having that difficult, difficult discussion or the hugs and the embraces on Christmas morning or the happy birthday parties, or swimming together in the pool, or going to get soft drinks after the baseball game and the conversations that are had there. You know, these are the personal elements that, honestly, Joy and I, when we, before we, when she was pregnant with our first baby, we, of course, probably had an awareness that those things were coming in the years to come. But it wasn't until we got there that we realized this is really personal. As a parent, you can't just drop your kid off at school, pick them up, and put a dinner plate in front of them at the end of the day. There's a lot more to being a parent. There's a lot more personal investment that goes into it. But as Catholics, we have, a, we have in a certain way a handicap. Because we have outward expressions— And we have sacraments, and we have a visible church, and we have bishops and priests and deacons and medals and sacramentals. There's a danger in that we can fake it. We can wear the necklace. We can go through the outward rites. And we cannot have, at the same time, a true inward conversion. It's, I think, easier to be a hypocrite as a Catholic than it is, say, a Protestant. I've been both, right? As a Catholic, you can, you know, have the sacramentals and you could have the outward things. You know, look at the, um, you know, look at the movie Godfather. You know, you've got these Italian mobsters who are doing ungodly, <laughs> sinful things, mortal sins, and yet they have this outward piety, these outward rites, these you know confirmation parties or first communion parties um, in which they can look like they are religious. That's, that's a problem, right? So we can fake it a little bit easier as Catholics. We can look outwardly as if we are serious about God when we're really not. Also, as Catholics, we can get people to conform to the outward religion in a, in a much easier way. You know, we can maybe even get people to come to church once a week to fulfill their quote-unquote obligation. However, in our own time, we begin to see that whole system crack. You know, if you're in a tough marriage, it's much easier to get a divorce and remarry someone else. Um, when it comes to the sexual teachings of the church, it's much easier to live in the hookup culture when in your late teens or in your early 20s than it is to embrace sacramental marriage and the teaching of the church on contraception. So in our own time, we've seen this kind of outward display of piety begin to crack and break. And so the answer to it is to call our own hearts and to call our family and to call our friends back to a personal experience of Jesus Christ. And the good news is He is waiting there right now in this moment to engage with us in a personal and real experience, to begin to guide you, to begin to give you new gifts, to give you consolations, to give you direction in your life, in your apostolate, and in your friendship. So I'm going to give you three uh, exhortations. Uh, three challenges to help you kickstart a personal 
Catholic relationship with Christ. And the first one and the most important that I really can't stress enough is mental prayer. Mental prayer is not vocal prayer. Vocal prayer is the prayers that we memorize. And those are great. I pray vocal prayers every morning, throughout the day, and in the evening. You know, for example, when I sit down at a meal, bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty, that's a vocal prayer. It's good. The Our Father is a vocal prayer. The Hail Mary is a vocal prayer. But mental prayer is when you speak to God with your heart. This is when you address God and you say things like, God, I really hate my job. I don't know what to do. Or you say, God, my marriage is so hard right now. What do I do next? Or this is where you say, God, I'm so thankful for my birthday today. I'm so grateful to be alive. Thank you. Or this is when you say, God, why can't my wife and I have any children? Or when you say, God, how can we have any more children? Our budget is already stretched way too tight. I don't know how we're going to make ends meet. Or when you say, God, they're starting to lay people off at work. I'm afraid. I don't know what I'm going to do. Or you say, God, my child has left the church. Why did you let this happen? What's going on in his life? Or when you say as a grandparent, God, thank you for my 11 grandchildren. Whatever it is, this is you being raw with God. This is when you open your heart and you dump out whatever's in your heart. And that's exactly what Jesus wants you to do. Read the Psalms. King David is opening his heart and he's being raw with God. You can see him at times sad and discouraged, even depressed, I would say. You can see him angry with God. You can see him asking questions of God. You can see him praising God. You can see him thanking God. What you see is a real personal interaction between a human, a sinner, a believer, and God himself. And the Psalms are the pattern for our own prayer life. So you can do it at your house. I like to do it at a church. I prefer to do it before the Blessed Sacrament, though it doesn't always happen. And to just dump out your heart before God. So that's the first one in mental prayer. And honestly, it's hard to do. This is not something easy. With time, with practice, it becomes easier. Just like playing the piano or playing guitar, it becomes easier to speak with God. But when you do it, you're going to find yourself sitting in a room in the quiet alone and saying, God, I don't know what to say. Or you're going to start thinking about your checklist or your budget or when you need to pick up the kids from school or whatever it is. And in those moments, you just keep turning back to God and you say, God, I'm really distracted right now. Or how am I going to pick up the kids at school when I have to go and take so-and-so here? Whatever it is, you just talk to God like you talk to anyone. Okay, so that's the first one is to cultivate a life of mental prayer. I've asked the students um, at the New St. Thomas Institute to do f at least five minutes every day. And I would encourage everyone listening to do five minutes of talking to God every day. And I think the goal is to work up to 45 minutes to an hour every day talking to God. That should be your goal. But don't get stressed out. Don't get worried about it. Just start with five minutes. You know, it's kind of like when you're getting married, you go on dates before you get married. You know, it takes a while to, to rev things up. So five minutes every day, mental prayer. The second is I would encourage you to find friends who speak and love or speak about and love Jesus. You know, so, sometimes we Catholics can be so reticent to talk about our faith and to talk about our struggles and to talk about what's going on on the inside. Um, and we have to search out for people who have this fire on the inside, who love Jesus. These are people you could go to a coffee shop or a bar and talk about Jesus. Not just about facts, you know, not just, this is the kind of thing that I like to do because I'm an academic, you know, is get with someone who's really smart and has studied a lot of church history and we talk about, you know, St. Athanasius and when he said this or, you know, um, St. Gregory of Nazianzus and um, St. Ambrose of Milan and, oh yeah, did you read that? And No, that's, that's good. That's great. But this is more of a conversation about your heart um, with another believer. 
I know my my wife. I have friends like this. My wife has cultivated, I would say, probably two or three friendships, and she tries to go at least once a month out to dinner with with these women or with one of them singularly, and they talk about just the deep longings of their heart in the context of faith, in the context of them being Catholics. It's a great encouragement. So pray for friends like that. I did a whole podcast. I would encourage you to find it. It's called How to Find how to find friends like Samwise Gamgee from the Lord of the Rings and how we look at the Lord of the Rings and we talk about how important it is to have friends who can carry you and who can talk you out of your discouragement and your anger during the times of your life because we all experience that. We need friends who lift us up and carry us. So and then the third one, so the first one is mental prayer. Second one's find friends. The third one is to get engaged in activities where you will be around people who encourage you to be this kind of a Christian. This takes time. Sometimes it takes money. It takes effort. But you know what? It's worth it. You'll get paid back a hundredfold if you do it. So go to a conference. Help organize a conference. Be a volunteer at a conference. Some of the greatest Catholics I've ever met are these lovely people who volunteer at Catholic conferences. I've spoken at Catholic conferences all over America, Canada, all over the place, and these are the people who come and pick up the speakers at the airport or who help arrange books or introduce the speakers or help set out lunch. These people are beautiful, and the people at the conferences are on fire, Catholics, disciples of Jesus Christ. So go to the places where you're going to find people who have this in common with you. Uh, Another great way to do it is a pilgrimage. Pilgrimages, there's nothing like a pilgrimage to make friends fast because in pilgrimages, you're in a strange place. You're traveling. There's always interruptions to your life when you're traveling. The food, the uh, deadlines, the movements, going to a place, experiencing supernatural, wonderful things with other people who you don't know. You bond very quickly. I think of our pilgrimage we just took um, several months ago to Guadalupe in Mexico City. I still keep up with the people who I'd never met before on that pilgrimage because we experienced amazing, I would say even miraculous things on that pilgrimage. We're going on a pilgrimage to Rome in a month and a half. We still have a couple spots. So if You want to go on a pilgrimage to Rome? Come with me. Let's go. Let's travel. We'll eat food together. We will, I'm sure, have to hustle around a couple times, but we're going to be praying and having Mass in the most holy places in Italy, and we're going to grow deeper together. I would also encourage you, wherever you are, join a Bible study, a small group. You know, maybe get three or four people together and meet once a week. Have coffee and go through a book of the Bible. I would recommend go through Romans. Get four or five people, go through the book of Romans, have a Bible study. So again, the three things are mental prayer, find some friends, and then third, get engaged. Conferences, Bible studies, small groups, pilgrimages, whatever it is, get engaged with other people and where you can experience Catholicism, not just as a religion, but as a relationship with God vertically, and with other people horizontally. All right, before we do our tip of the week, just a few announcements, not very many this week. Uh, The first one is that this podcast is available on YouTube. Not everybody goes to iTunes or Stitcher and all that, so we've made it available on YouTube. So if you want to watch some of the older episodes, the new ones aren't up yet, you can go to um, YouTube and you can listen to these podcasts there. Also, my... Um, novel, the follow-up novel, the sequel to my best-selling novel, Sword and Serpent, will be out this year. Just finished it this past weekend, and I'd like to say that it is even better than the first one. I'm so excited about it. It's got St. George in it. It's got St. Christopher and a very key part in this story. Of course, Constantine the Great um, also introduced St. Helen, Constantine's mother, St. Catherine of Alexandria is another major player in this book and probably at least another um, eight or ten Catholic saints 
uh, appear in this historical fiction novel. So what I've done is I've gone back to the year 299, 300, and I'm retelling the story of these Catholic saints as they interact with each other um, in in interesting ways. And I try to make it as historical as possible. And along the way, there's a lot of, um, I think, profound theology as we watch these people who, many of which are saints, um, come to grasp um, who they are as Christians without being preachy. So if you're into that, uh, please get the first book. Uh, It's called Sword and Serpent by Taylor Marshall. You can get it at Amazon.com, and uh, you can read the reviews there. And look for, I'll be telling you on the podcast, but look for the second book, the sequel, coming out this year. You can also uh, download the study guide at swordandserpent.com. And also, um, classes at New St. Thomas Institute are flowing. We have a whole new curriculum going now in Catholic Church history. If you'd like to learn more about that and sign up and take online Catholic courses with me, Taylor Marshall, go to NewStThomas.com, NewStThomas.com, and summer enrollment will be ending uh, in the next, I think, 10 days. So if you want to sign up, please do so soon. Okay, our tip of the week is read the Didache. You might be thinking, what did you just say? The Didache. Yeah, the Didache is an early Christian document, maybe as early as the year 70, maybe as late as, you know, 130, 150, probably not that late. But it's one of the most ancient documents about what Christianity looked like just after the time of the apostles. And it gives you an insight into what Christians were saying, doing, and thinking. It's very short. You can read it in one sitting. I would say you could probably read it in under 15 minutes, but it'll open your eyes in a big way to early Christianity. So go to, um, you can go to the show notes for this podcast at taylormarshall.com, and I've linked a, um, a free digital copy of the Didache there. So um, go to taylormarshall.com and find this episode, which is episode 109, and click on the link there, or Google it. I'm sure you can find the Didache. It's spelled D-I-D-A-C-H-E. And if you're new to this podcast, please head over to taylormarshall.com and you can get a free book, uh, Thomas Aquinas in 50 Pages. You can download it from the top right-hand corner of my webpage, taylormarshall.com. I post there um, during the week theological um, articles uh, pertaining to Catholic history, Catholic theology, Catholic philosophy. And I'd like to give a shout out to everyone who rated this podcast in the last week. Um, one going out to who they left their name as disabled user. So disabled user, thanks for leaving a five star review. And the review of the week goes to Jojo Patras. And Jojo writes, Dr. Marshall's teaching on the book of Revelation is both inform- informative and insightful. His use of the teachings of the early church fathers adds a new dimension to the usual Bible study materials and is very helpful for a complete understanding. I highly recommend not only this podcast, but also Dr. Marshall's webinars. He is filling a needed chasm in Catholic teachings and theology for the average lay person and religious. Thank God for Dr. Marshall and his conversion to Catholicism. So, Jojo, thank you so much for those kind words. And if you listening would like to leave a shout out, I'll Uh, mention you by name, and perhaps read out your whole review. It's a great help for me because it helps people on iTunes find this podcast, find this show, so that they can gain Catholic teaching. If you want to do that, go to taylormarshall.com forward slash shout out, and you can leave a review there. And now for our Latin word of the week, which is relatio. Relatio, where we get the word relation or relationship. Uh, It comes from a Latin word that means to call back, to report, to refer. Um, So a relationship is really a calling back. It's an answer. It's a response. It's a reference to another person. It, It implies a communication. And so while we do, I already covered religio, in the earlier part of this podcast, which is a Latin word, which is like a ligament binding together. This is more of a response. 
And so God speaks to us. Jesus Christ stands at the door and he knocks. And so our response, our reference back to him is to open the door and say, Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my home. Come into my kitchen. Let's sit down. Let's come to know each other. And in doing so, I want you to transform and to change me. So there it is, the Latin word, relatio. And some of our listeners have asked that I close with a prayer on the pa- on the podcast. And so I'm going to occasionally end the podcast with the prayer. And there's no obligation, but if you would, please join with me in prayer if you like. And I would encourage you to make this your own prayer. Gracious Father, you love me. Your Son, Jesus Christ, died for me. And in gratitude, I want to know you and love you in the depths of my broken heart. Because of your kindness, I repent of my sins. By the fire of your Holy Spirit, allow me to have a deep personal relationship with you and to draw other people into your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my brothers and sisters in Christ, God has a wonderful plan in store for you today and in your whole life. You are the apple of his eye, as it says in the Bible. And until next time, Remember, our Lord Jesus Christ said that you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. Adeo Patre Nostro et a Jesu Cristo. Pax Vobis.